So, you know, Vernon and I go way back. I think we, you know, I think King Kong lives is the first time we worked together. Right, right. And did a lot, many shows together, and he always had these great stories on Blue Velvet. And uh, one of them was a scene that they shot on the rooftop of the Carolina apartments in a thunderstorm. What? Yeah. <laughs> like something you don't do. And I think the whole crew, you know, was having to deal with that one. And there's this other story that took place inside the Barbary Coast that had to do with a topless woman in matchsticks. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> now, neither one of these made it into the movie. They, they were urban legends. I got you. you. Know? And, um, but lo and behold, this new 25th edition of Blue Velvet right. that was released, uh, the de- deleted scenes include both of those scenes. Oh, for crying out loud. It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> You know? That's funny. Well, you know, in the in Wilmington, I think Blue Velvet really captured Wilmington beautifully. Frederick Elms shot the movie, um, and Wilmington was a very different place then. It was, and um, Truly and the Barbary was. Coast certainly was a scary place. It, um, to be honest with you, I don't think I went into the Barbary Coast for the first time until the late nineties. Yeah, <laughs> it was a college bar. Yeah, exactly. And um, but Vernon and I would always dare each other to go on Tuesday nights. We had a Tuesday night ritual, okay. and we would, you know, ask for volunteers, and no one would go. But he and I would both dare ourselves to go to the Barbary Coast. And I can tell you, it was a life-threatening, life-changing event every Tuesday. And a night. great time. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> always a great story. Yeah. All right, speaking of stories, uh, episode three, Rap Beer. John, who we got today? John Bankson, who was Dennis Hopper's honey wagon driver, and none other than Vernon Harrell, who had a front row seat as the prop guy. Excellent. Let's get into it, shall we? Go. Vernon Harrell, how did you end up on Blue Velvet? I started on uh, Firestarter, and I was in the catering department. Sucked. Worst job I've ever had. Yeah. But I met a bunch of people, one of whom was Tantar. Um, We lived just down the street from each other. I went back to my old job um, before the movie business. And um, two and a half years later, I quit the job, and he said, you know, I wasn't going to offer the business to you until you got out of the real job. And so what do you want to do? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll get in. So he offered the job of driving the prop truck, which, I mean, I had driven a five ton truck before, but not much. So it was kind of, you know, training on the job, but um, that's how I got into it by knowing Tantar and living just down the street. Back then in the art department, you often were the truck driver. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, a lot. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I started out driving the five ton. I took school bus lessons in high school because mm-hmm. the guy who taught him was really funny. He's like Jerry Clower. <laughs> you know, he's a hoot. And everyone's how oh, you gotta go take bus driving course, you know. Because remember in North Carolina back then, 16 year olds drove school buses. Oh, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 It was if it you was... had a driver's license and you went to school bus driving class at your high school, you got to drive the school bus if you wanted it, if you wanted the job. And they needed school bus drivers. And but that prepared me to drive five tons, you know, learn how to friction right. clutch and all that kind of stuff. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember Tantor, that was like 18th street, 19th street. 19th street. Yeah. 19th street. I, I lived remember, down at the very, very end of 19th. I remember that. He lived about a half a block away. In that so, little uh, apartment up above the way. You know, mm-hmm. it, Tantar is such a pivotal character in my life and, and career and all of it, you know, in many ways. And I'm trying to figure how do we cover Tantar, you know, yeah, one of I'm my favorite stars. quotes of all time, work related, comes from him, which is that the last minute isn't too late. Yeah. I thought that was Vernon's. I, no, I picked it up from Tantar. Uh, okay, yeah. well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, it was second. The last second is not <laughs> last too late. Last second, that's <laughs> right. Second after that, you're in deep shit. That's right. But yeah. Still. No, and Tantar would be last second is not too late. Mo. Yeah. <laughs> Mo. <laughs> <laughs> he came to a party we had once uh, when I was living with Brian Stultz and writes for West. And, right. and Tantar had been in his cups. It was one of those summer afternoons and everyone was pretty well lit up. And uh, he walked through a glass door <laughs> with a beer in his hand. Oh, Fortunately, it was a can. And he just walked right through it. And he looked down. There was a piece of glass in the can. He took the piece of glass, 
and flicked it and just came in and sat out on the couch. Just like nothing had happened. No so cleanup, no, that. no fear, no nothing. That was the same party that uh, Moose ate a light bulb. Yeah, Tantar, he, he, he ruled with an iron fist and stuff, but it was, it, it was always for a good reason. I mean, it, it, during the work day, there's a real precision, about, you know, and, and. Oh, you mean like when he came on the truck for the first time and said, I want this and I couldn't produce it within two minutes. And so he started pulling out drawers and dumping them on the floor yeah. of the truck. It's not here. It's not here. <laughs> it was horrible. I never worked for the guy, sadly. I mean, but uh, I heard, I heard all the stories and uh, I saw all the post-traumatic stress. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So. I've, I've had some therapy, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> For you. But I'll I'll get better soon. <laughs> when you're dead, I don't, I don't know. I th- think there's some there's some really basic um, uh, norms of the business that I learned from him. They're just always right. You know, like if you were given a list, you had to get that list done. That's true. You know? And, and never yeah. come back with nothing. I don't care if it's totally wrong. Right. Have something in your hand when you come back. Right. Yeah. Exactly. He was just always thinking of the problem or thinking of the permutations or thinking of the option, thinking of what could go wrong. Yep. You know, Laterally. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Rambling Rose. And we were up on the shooting on the Black River. And the whole idea is shooting a picnic on the river during magic hour. And we had it all set up, period movie. And we're out there, we have it all set up, nice blanket, beautiful food, this, that, and the other. And um, and the director, Martha Coolers, comes out and she goes, I'd really like to have them fishing instead. Now, we hadn't prepared for that so, um, period picture and stuff. And right as I get ready to say, I'm sorry, you can hear the whir of the diesel. Remember Helga, right? <laughs> we're at the end of a dirt road. <laughs> Sun setting, and you hear the whir of the diesel. Here comes Tantar, and um, and sure enough, he's holding cane fishing poles over the top of the car. And all he does is he throws them down on the side of the road, does a U turn, drives off, says, "You might need these, Mo." <laughs> That's hilarious. That's a classic. We got yeah. fishing poles. <laughs> That's funny. It's true, and and he would do that on a regular basis. Show up just. How did he know? How did he know? Theory did. But I think once you see it, once you once you experience that, it really allows you to start thinking that way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's true. Yeah. And, um, Contingencies. Yeah. Right. Always. And you, you, if you think in a visual fashion, okay, they're here. There's a river. What else would you do besides have a picnic? That sort right. of thing. Right. right. And he's forever immortalized in Blue Velvet. He's he's on the address. Or the directory. when they go to find uh, Dorothy's apartment. He knew how to get his name in there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. When did you know that you were going to stick with it? Um, I think I realized I was unhirable in any other arena <laughs> <laughs> pretty early on. And uh, I'd done, I done. I agree with that. I, um, I had an, an internship at CNN, which was supposed to be like the golden ticket in between my junior and senior year of college, where it's like you're in, you know, they took four people out of 300 applicants or something. And I was like, ah, broadcast news kind of blows. I'm not doing this. And uh, so that was about as conservative as I got at New York. And uh, I never really thought about it, but I managed to make enough to keep going. And uh, yeah, that's just the, you get paid for just, you know, doing really crazy stuff. And like, you know, you look back on the shit you've done and where you've been and where you've gone and people, you know, and the relationships you still maintain, like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I've known Vern. I've known you. I've known you since 1981. One, yeah. And I've known you, Vernon, since 1985. Yeah, that's true. That's like 40 years. Oh, stop! Yeah. Don't, don't. And okay. we all have all our digits, <laughs> and like the syphilis <laughs> outbreak has been remission. I mean, it's perfect. <laughs> At least a modicum of sanity, yeah. although that's right. a yeah. question now. John, I think I think a movie like Blue Velvet or David Lynch movie. You, you, you got to kind of laugh hysterically at half of it and be mortified at the other half. And I think then you get it. You know, if you kind of go through and don't find a humor, you'll miss part of it. And yeah, I agree. If you're not scared shitless, you're, you're missing. Uh, yeah. So. He comes, he, his narrative is not like anybody else's, no doubt about it. And, and having rewatched the movie a few days ago, it's just all of those like saturated primary colors in the opening Beautiful. and in the tail end. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And then the rest of the movie is just completely gray and brown. It's and, and blue, of course. But uh yeah, he, he definitely has a huge mind for the visuals. And yeah, I like what he did with the town too. A lot of brick, tons of brick. 
you know, I didn't work on the show. I was on Manhunter. So I was, a, I felt like I was a spectator to the production. You know, there's one night I was walking down Franklin street and it was Doug White and Paul Sebastian set dressers holding floor lamp outside of Stimmerman's just cowering <laughs> because they had to take that light lamp. They're waiting for a cut and they had to take, but, but whatever was going on up there, I'm pretty sure it was a, you know, Dean Stockwell scene or, or yeah, something. That's, that's the famous did. story of the whole movie. What's that one? So uh, we're standing around doing nothing. Um, and that a really steep staircase, the, the, right. the building you, which you reference, and there's second floor, no elevator. David Lynch comes down and says, we need a horse. We got to have a horse in Ben's apartment. And everybody's like, and Fred Caruso, the producer comes over and goes, Dave, we can't do a horse. We just, this, we can't, you know, we need a crane. You have to knock out a window. It's the middle, you know, it's like 10 o'clock at night. And so David's not happy. He wants a horse bat. So this guy rides by, elderly gentleman rides by on a bike with a white wicker purse. He throws his purse into the rain ditch, which is still there. I saw it last time I was in Wilmington. So we being bored drivers and, you know, nothing to do, we fish it out. And inside the purse is a copperhead that's frozen. Swear to God, this is all true. <laughs> And uh, so we're like, wow, this is weird. I mean, it's a snake and it's, it's probably dead. And this one, and there was an extra who actually didn't work in the show or maybe a hanger on sort of goth chick. She goes, oh, I can, I can, uh, I can milk it. I can pull the venom off the snake. Get me a glass. And we're like, oh, this is great. <laughs> so we found a glass and she literally, you know, I saw the two fangs and all this stuff pour out. And David comes over and he's like, Great, a snake, perfect. And Fred Crusoe says, no way, David, we can't do it. It's a snake. So um, I don't know what happened or whatever, but if you watch the movie, Brad Dorff is on the sofa for three or four shots dancing with a snake. It's true. And uh, that's how it happened. I kept hearing it with uh, David Lynch would say, wouldn't it be neat if? And everyone's yeah. like, Pew. yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> true, yeah. Disappear. <laughs> oh my God. But Here's the other classic director. from that night was that uh, I was driving Dennis's trailer. So I had to wait till he was done. And he and Dean were fooling around. And I'm pretty sure one or both of them hooked up with the snake lady. Because the vans, the, the trailer's kind of <laughs> rocking like this. The sun's coming up over the river behind me, and everybody else is gone. It's eight o'clock and 7 30 in the morning. And the door opens and Dennis in his full Frank booth. He never took his costume off. He's like, fuck. <laughs> he jumps. He doesn't even use the stairs. He jumps out of the trailer and goes home. I think I remember that. I think I remember you coming home. Yeah. You know, that day going, you won't believe what happened. Yeah. I think I'm a witness to the. Any more words of Jack Buck, the old Dodgers announcer. I can't believe what I just saw. <laughs> There's a uh, well record that like Blue Velvet saved his life. Yeah. Just because, you know, coming out of drug addiction, and, right. uh, self abuse, and, and all that. People weren't lining up at the door to give him a job. Right. And, and Fred Caruso got him that job. Uh -huh. And then, lo and behold, 1993, you know, 10 years later, or whatever, Fred Caruso called in the favor and had Dennis Hopper come work on uh, Super Mario Brothers. Ah, I didn't know right. that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's why. Yeah, he, he was the ba main bad guy. Wow, I never he, saw that. Uh, Oopa, well, Not many people did. You didn't, you didn't miss anything. Yeah. And um, but and uh, the so, new one killed it. Yeah. But it was truly, you know, Fred Grusso calling in the favor, calling the chip. You got to come do this. Right. That's how I really want to do it. And again, and I was on the set that day where he's. He's got this weird hairdo and he's all just going, who wrote this shit? <laughs> <laughs> Crappy move. But the best thing he did, he took his paycheck from Super Mario Brothers and he bought the uh, Masonic Temple on yep. downtown Wilmington. We had the building. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Which, um, which when I showed up in 84, 85, it was, you could smell the wet rot, you know, on mm -hmm. the sidewalk from that building. We would climb up the fire escape and sneak in there. Oh, this is great, you know. 
the room, Amazing. the ballroom, incredible, the theater, yeah. and this and the other, and, and the he saved it. Well, and there's it rumor tell that he was going to start an acting school there too, and that never really came to right. fruition. Yeah. Well, he sunk a ton yeah. of money into it. Yeah, it was but. it was literally his paycheck from Super Mario. He Dennis Hopper taught me how to play Texas Hold'em because yeah. there was a little trailer game, and they needed an extra guy, so that was me. <laughs> and so it was him and like his little posse. And uh, one time, and we played for matches. And one time, right. I had a big old pile of matches, and they were we were doing the car stuff when they're driving around with Jeffrey, and you know, everyone's got the lights on ropes, and they're just throwing them around the whole fake poor right. man's process. Right. And Dennis is like that driver kid, you know, he's way ahead in the game. We might have to send him a love letter. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, because he's got a gun, he's out of his mind, and he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Coming so, a little too close to me. Phone home. Call mom. Mom, I got news for you. you know? So 37 years later, I'm, I'm still in the film business because of those wonderful first movie experiences. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I don't remember yeah. a horse, but I do remember a woman um, in a Mylar wig, purple Mylar wig, was in a cab, drove by, basically, you know, had the traffic stopped and, and then they released right. traffic and he was standing there and a cab goes by and a woman in a Mylar wig um, mm -hmm was in the cab and he said, stop that cab. I wanted that woman. Got her out and put her in front of the, of the um, restaurant and said, I want somebody uh, to Vernon, Vernon, go over there and, and, and put that, put that traffic cone on your head and, and talk to the woman. And as far as I know, it, you know, I dropped onto the cutting room floor as quick as it got there. But at the same time, that was my debut in the film business. Oh, yes. Oh. Well, remember, there's Backseat Bonnie, too. Backseat oh. Bonnie, for sure. Mm -hmm. Legend. Yeah. And uh, I think David saw her just walking down Market Street one day, and he goes, she must be in the movie. And she's in the back room of Ben's apartment, and then she does her famous dance. On the roof of the car. For the extended Candy Colored Clown sequence. Yep. But the funny part is, if you watch her dance, she's got no rhythm with the song well, whatsoever, no. but well, it's no, no. perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. ideal. <laughs> she gave me a bracelet at the end of her time working on the movie. And really? I, was like, oh, I cherished it. It was like a rubber gasket, you know? It was just, I was like, oh man, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. She washed and folded my laundry for me after the Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, was she had job, a number you know? of jobs. I, I saw yeah. her like 15 years later and she looked exactly the same. Yep. Worked at the laundry up by Whitey's. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. And she worked at the Dixie Grill. Downtown. As a waitress. The yeah. old Dixie, waitress, right. The old yeah. Dixie Grill. Mm -hmm. And so you would all then see her riding the bus. She'd catch the bus back and mm -hmm. forth. She right. She's a really nice person. I yeah. enjoyed her. I liked her yeah. too. And yeah. she's she's in cinema history now. Oh like God. Fred Making Pickler. out with Brad Dourif. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Fred Pickler is another like local legend. Ooh. I just saw him a few years ago. He's yeah. uh, he David met him because he was like, I think Tantar brought him in because he was the Guns. Remington rep. Yep. Right. Yep. And David loved him and he became the yellow man. And and uh Fred Pickler told me two or three years ago that he go he was in like Munich or Frankfurt on a vacation, and somebody came up to him and said, "Yellow man." It's true. Yeah, I heard that same story from Fred. Yeah, <laughs> so. like thirty years later, I mean, that's crazy. It is that they would recognize him, yeah. and you know, yeah. somebody would hold on to it for that long. He does kind of look the same. There was an actually a documentary crew. I never saw their work, but it was a really tall blonde hair guy and a really short dark haired guy who smoked all the time who were, when we were making the movie, were doing their own little documentary stuff too. I don't know what ever happened to that. Hmm. Ooh, but little, they were interesting. They were both German, very German and very detailed, like, <laughs> you know, skinny jeans way before skinny jeans were cool. You know? <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. The, the things that I did seemed to me because it was my first show on set, like, Oh, this is so weird, but this must be the movie business. No, this was David Lynch, and he put things together in such a way that even the weird stuff looked totally bizarre. Right. It was a higher art, I think. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. He's thinking at a different level. Yeah, definitely. I took my first trip to New York, you know, kind of having her visit, went to stay with Wombat uh, up at uh, Columbia University, and we took the train into the village, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure it was opening weekend. It may have been opening night. I think probably premiered Friday or whatever. And this was Saturday night in the village, hmm. full theater, blue velvet. Holy cow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. What a buzz. You know, what a buzz. I think we went over to Washington Park, bought a little bit of weed, you know, smoked up before we went in. 
And I never, and, and for me, having just started and had a few credits in the movie business as a work, that was my first experience of, holy mackerel, you know, look what happened down there in mm-hmm. Wellington. And that could arrest an entire theater in New York City, you know. It's funny because I don't remember the first time I saw the movie, but my mom went to see it because she was Ooh. proud. Yeah. And, and she <laughs> your first, it was your first credit. Yeah, John, my maybe. first credit. <laughs> and uh, my mom, she literally left early, like before the credits came because she didn't want to be recognized. <laughs> like maybe somebody in the audience would know her. <laughs> So I was like, and she didn't, she didn't tell me to stop making pornography. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I can guarantee you that neither of my parents ever saw that movie. (laughs) (laughs) No. Uh, My boss on Blue Velvet was the transportation coordinator was a woman named Pat Hill, who was about four feet, nothing Mm -hmm. and kind of crazy. And, And uh, but she was tough. I mean, she, you, yeah. you did what she wanted because you knew there was somebody behind her much bigger. Yeah. And, uh, exactly. And she, uh, but she hired a bunch of kids to drive trailers and trucks. And, mm-hmm. and my interview was a, to back up a Ford F-150 with a two banger trailer behind it, 300 yards straight. And I pulled it off and then you got the job. I got a second gig, which was, uh, I got to be sort of Dennis Hopper's kind of go-to guy when he wanted to do stuff. Like, and Fred would throw me like an extra hundred bucks. And uh, there's multiple stories about that. The best one being that uh, he had bet a bunch of money on the Larry Holmes, Michael Spinks fight. This is 1985. And Spinks was a huge underdog. And, and he was a funny looking guy. And, you know, I think uh, Eddie Murphy did a hilarious thing on Michael Spinks. But anyway, so, so uh, Fred says, yeah, Dennis wants to go see the fight. And I'm like, Oh my God. You know, and he used to wear his Frank Booth stuff. And he, yeah. And, and, but he wouldn't be recognizable. I don't think so. I took him to Katie's right. across from the college, which used to be kind of a rough and tumble place before a little burger joint. Yeah. But it was also kind of a bar. And, right. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. good for, for students. And they had, they had motorcycle people there. Yeah. And so anyway, so, so, uh, you know, first, second round, no big deal. And, uh, Dennis buys beers and hands them to me two of them because he's on the wagon at this point. He's just been, he's been through rehab like early, seven or eight months earlier. And uh, he goes, you're drinking for two. Yeah. <laughs> cause he was getting a little nervous cause he had a bunch of money on this fight. And uh, ultimately Sphinx wins the fight and Dennis had four to one's odd. He goes, I just won fucking $40,000. Nice. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh my God. So I'm hammered. Cause I've been drinking for Dennis the whole and time. You're the driver. And I'm the driver. So Dennis drives the van. So I get back to work the next day. I've been in the film business maybe two weeks, three weeks. And Pat says, where's the van? And I said, Dennis has the van. And she said, okay, that's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Dennis was at that point, uh, you know, just out of rehab. He was nervous about things. Like when he had to take pills on set, he had Shaw Bernie take one of the pills first. He'd he'd shake it around and. Okay, you take this. And Whoa. because he had had somebody dose him. And so he was not taking any chances. Holy cow. Yeah. Well, you know, you think about it. I mean, you know, he spent a year in the desert just mm-hmm. trying to get his act together right, right before that. Right, right. The other story I heard was that Dean, all these guys are dead, so we can talk at length. Uh, Dean Stockwell, who played Ben, he had just come up from a two show gig on Miami Vice in Miami. And he brought the Bolivian marching powder with him. Good Lord. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think for that entire performance, he was pretty hammered. Because remember when he goes, here's to your fuck, Frank. Well, they were all out of it. Yeah. And then, um, and then Brad Dourif and... Uh, Jack Nance. And Jack Nance. Uh-huh. And we're, and we're going to have to talk about the fishing trip sooner or later. <laughs> Back up the goddamn boat. <laughs> Damn fish. Uh, I, I, every time I hear someone caught an amberjack, I flash back to Jack Nance. Yeah.
you got hired on Blue Velvet. You were staying, you know, sleeping on my couch yeah. in Hampton. You got going on Blue Velvet. I didn't. I got Manhunter, and I'm working. We're prepping. And it was a Friday night. You called and said, we're going on a fishing trip tomorrow, which means what? We're up at 5 to go down to Carolina Beach. Oh, yeah, jump on the boat. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and it's Doug DeRose and Welch Lambeth. And Brad Dorif. And, and, and then and, we went and picked up Brad Dorif and, and Jack Nance. Exactly. And yeah. those two guys, they were in a bit of a state. They basically just huddled against each other. Like, you know, yeah, you know, Brad never said a word the entire time. Right. He wouldn't have none of it. And we, we were all young bucks, and we're down there, and you take your turn on the strikes, and we're on the boat, and those guys are huddled in the you know, in front of the boat, just trying to hope it, the whole day would go away. And we're out there <laughs> taking turns. Doug DeRose, I remember, had a good hit with the king, and I don't know if he brought it in or not. And next hit is Jack Nance's turn, and they hit a big old, like, 60-pound amber jack, and he, he fought that thing for an hour. Wow. For yeah. an hour. And he called it, he named the fish Leon Sphinx. <laughs> god damn fish oh i've never seen it before where like sweat beads just popped up in real time on his head he was like he was turning red and i thought oh my god we're gonna kill jack Nance. Uh, we're gonna kill a racer head and uh david lynch is gonna kill us <laughs> chances get him back alive or kneel anyway you know? <laughs> but the best part was he fish. finally gets the fish in after yeah. back up the goddamn <laughs> boat and it's it's full of worms. I mean, this thing <laughs> was nasty. You, you, you throw amberjacks back. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, sometimes they're okay, but this one was, oof, and it was big. It was probably, you know, I'd say 15, six, 20 pounds. 60, no, it's a 60 pound. I really? remember it. It's a wow. 60 pound amberjack. Damn, yeah. Another fishing story. And uh, yeah, and Jack's like, God damn fish. Yeah. What was that moment in the business where he said, I'm sticking, I'm staying, I'm in? Oh, that was after Blue Velvet. You know, I, I, was I, there a moment where you... I'm, I'm, I'm in the movie business. I'm in there for life. Yeah, I, I, it was. And, and I have to say, I never said in it for life because I had I was schizophrenic of my employment. Um, whenever the film business left town, I went back to Harold's department store because I had that whole life to to deal with. In Burgall, North Carolina, ladies right. and gentlemen. Yep. Uh, and, and Vernon was on the front page of the New York Times, by the way, <clears throat> color photo. No, no, front page of the business section. Oh, really? I thought you were on the front. No, front. no, no. I didn't oh, make the front. Excuse me. Yeah, but it was yeah. in, on the paper and in the digital. In fact, you can go on and find the whole article. Um, Harold's Department Store, New York Times. Celebrating the long history. The and demise the, of the And the demise. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry, I, I'm, I'm trying to thank you, be gentle. Thank you. Here. But no, I, it was, I took a 117-year-old business and closed it down. So i um, still in the process. Oh, the cow. Well, here's a funny Laura Dern story. So uh, we were, Hurricane Gloria was coming into town and I was sort of the driver for those guys a little bit. So uh, we, I was told to go, they were staying at the Greystone, David and, and uh, Kyle McLaughlin and uh, Isabella and Laura were all staying at the Greystone. Right. This is right before, you know, it, it was, this is the, before the world of Air, Airbnb. And I think that they made a deal with the guy who was owning it and fixing it up. And, and, uh, so I went with Laura to the supermarket to buy food for the hurricane to prepare. And so she has stuff like barley and, and kel kale and all this like, you know, really healthy stuff, like a big old vat of yogurt. And I've got TP and cold beer, of course, you know, which right. is what you really need. Exactly. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, what's the matter? Are you afraid of dying? And Laura looked at me and she said, what's the matter? Are you afraid of living? Ooh. Yeah, it's like, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny check So, I mean, a couple more things about, about Blue Velvet. Uh, one was that David Lynch was obsessed with the Bushoni big boy. And his assistant oh. was a guy named John Wentworth, who I knew his sister. His sister is an actress and pretty well known, but he grew up in D.C. and I knew him from D.C. And anyway, so 
John Wentworth somehow managed to procure like a three foot tall statue of the Shoney big boy Ooh. and, and put it in David's office. And that was it. I mean, he was made from that point on. And we also had a thing called big Dave's spud farm, which was out a window of his office was a little ranch. I remember to, that to grow potatoes. And it had a brilliant sign written by the sign shop, big Dave's spud farm. And David Lynch would go every day and look at it. And his uh, potatoes. Yeah, that's true. And he I also that. he also wore the same clothes every day. Like he had no, a white the same clothes, no. same style. It white was, shirt, khaki pants, dark jacket, long sleeve white shirt, right. buttoned to the top. Right. And and the grips made a tie for him out of duvetine with a couple of electrical tape stripes. He wore it like the last three weeks of the movie yep. completely. Yep. yep. And uh, yeah, he was, David was one of a kind. And one time we were late, I was picking him up to drive him to work. And uh, there was like a mangled bird in the middle of the road. And it's like on 4th Street. And it was like the first week of filming. And uh, we were late. You know, we were late because David was just looking at the bird. I, what was I going to do? He was literally staring at this mush bird for 10, 15 minutes. And I told, I told the AD, I said, dude. David's looking at a carcass of a bird. Thank God he didn't make me pick it up. <laughs> I was getting ready to say, who's going to take the bird with him? You know? speak, speak. And I, I think it was the motivation for the robin at the end that's like so animatronic and fucked up that you're just like you have to just laugh and cry at the same right. time. He was looking for a real bird and nobody yeah. could quite get the bird to work, you know? Yeah. How do you train a robin? Yeah, exactly. So we 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 all felt that, you know, the, it's the Robin, you know, like when we're yeah. doing the next movies, the next wave of movies after Blue Velvet, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, the Robin was like a standard, you know, we got to, you know, well, you know, it's like the line that I put in the text. It's like, you know, there's a lot of things bad. That's what that's what Sandy says is that there's a lot of bad's going to happen until the Robins come. And then at the end, she says, I guess this is the Robins, the Robins are bad. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's all kinds of little weird ligature in that. There's be beautiful Easter eggs and stuff. Yeah, you know, exactly. The sun drop bottle, whoever got the sun drop bottle in there was, was awesome. Yeah. And, you know, in the, in the ear, obviously, the ear is famous, and Jeff Goodwin did a great job with the ear. It's still his masterpiece. Or early in his, yeah, very early in his career. But He's I leveraged want, that really But well. I want to know who did the ants, man. Red I met the guy. The guy. The guy. The came to set. Awesome. Yeah, and I think I think that the Beatles were stock. Beatles. No, they were no. not stock. I was the Beatle Wrangler. See, it was there a second you unit deal. It was tough because, you know, basically I had a big bottle of Beatles, and whenever I poured them out, they would all just disperse. Right. And it took me a little while to realize that oh, when you cool them down, they can't move as fast. Right. So I put them on ice. I mean, not literally, but at the same time, I, I cooled them down. Uh -huh. And that was what made them slow down to the point that the camera could drop down below the grass and see the beetles. Jesse Helms was a big proponent of this anti-pornography statute in the state of North Carolina. Right. And, right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, so about three weeks after that, we were shooting, I think it was on Carroll Street, which was the exterior of the Beaumont house. Which is oh, yeah. where, which is where Isabella walks up naked, all you know, in really, really rough shape, and scheduling being what it was, the L and the AD decided to schedule that for like a Friday night, right? Mm -hmm. So around eight thirty, nine o'clock, it gets dark, and we have a, quite a crowd from the neighborhood. Right, everybody's. I mean, you know, moms, dads, kids, grandma, grandpa, yeah. sitting out in lawn chairs watching the movie. Yeah, but but the movie includes a totally naked, you know, actress. Yeah. yeah, and like, and I was sitting standing next to a like a guy in overalls who seemed like a total redneck, and he's like, "They say she's a world famous model," <laughs> and I said, "Yes, sir, she's a world famous model," and he goes, "Face model, you mean?" <laughs> And I was like, oh. I was like, ow, dude, that is mean. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know. I didn't even know. How do you even know what a face model was? <laughs> guy was from Leland or some shit. You never know. <laughs> never know. So, so anyway, that was pretty funny. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, I got to give it to her because she went down the street and told all these people, yeah. you don't want your kids out here for this. Yeah. You know, don't, don't take mom and, and grandpa yeah. back in the house and. But she was such a pro. Unbelievable. She was. Yeah. She was. She was a real sweetheart. I enjoyed her company so much. She was just delightful. Yeah. But at the same time, after it was all done, the cop showed up and said, Ooh. there's been naked people out here. And they said, well, yeah, don't ever do that again. Oh, we won't. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and then there's the other time, like the we were at Screen Gems and uh, the sound mixer was broadcasting the the wireless mics on the FM band, which you know you can do. It's like it's sort of towards the well back then. That's what it was. Yeah, it was like the whole, but you didn't have to have it go live. Right. Um, so sort of down on the left side of the dial where college radio and NPR right. and all that right. stuff. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so we're listening outside cause it's on the stage and it's a closed set because it's all that really strange stuff with her and Frank getting all romantic. And the first couple days, the tank that Frank uses had helium in it. And, uh, and so he, so he's talking like, wah, 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 but he's saying that dialogue that everyone knows that's incredibly right. horrible and nasty. Right. And after the first day, David says to everybody, we can't do that anymore. So the tank was empty from there on out. Right. He switched to nitrous, didn't he? No. No. He never no. switched to no, nitrous. No, it was nothing. No. There was nothing there. I, I thought yeah. I, oh, it just. It was nothing. helium at the beginning. He was acting as but, a nitrous. But the best part is, is that, so this whole thing is being broadcast all over the neighborhood. Right. So there's people within like a five block area <laughs> Turn, that can hear all this going on. <laughs> Turning it on their stereo. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I think I think I heard an interview with him where he where he told David that it w- it would be nitrous. So as a performing, he was performing. Yeah, right. you know, exactly. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That makes sense. He was laughing and then having a big old time. Right. Yeah. And one time I, uh, you know, I was talking to him. I can't remember. Like the first thing he ever said to me. Dennis Hopper said was, uh, my piece is in the trailer and it's loaded. So you might want to lock it up. <laughs> that was literally the first thing he said. So I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> this guy suddenly got really deep here. Yeah. <laughs> but so one time I said to him, I said, you know, like, uh, you know, I got to ask you, you know, how can you, how, you know, you're an actor, you're a really accomplished, amazing actor. And like, how can you play this guy who is so uniquely horrible? I mean, archetypally terrible. And Dennis got like four inches in front of my face. And we're about the same size. He's not a tall man, like five, mm. six, five, seven. And he goes, what do you mean? I used to be Frank Booth. Ooh. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. he had a past. It was one of those things yeah. that, that he tried to keep him. Yeah. But. You know, I didn't get the manhunter job. Bummed out. You went to work. Remember that summer I was bartending down yeah. at the blockade runner? Yeah, it and was- I, I was working as a prep cook for that weird guy at the blockade runner and Oh, he yeah, kept giving me all this food, and then it turns out he wanted to hit on me. So, like, he gave me an entire food beef tenderloin, and when you don't have a job, like a three hundred dollars <laughs> piece of meat, it's pretty solid. <laughs> but it turns out he wanted to give me the real beef tenderloin. I remember Dan; he was Lebanese, and I remember I came up to you and guy. I said, "And I said, John, I gotta quit, man. I gotta get out of here." And he's like, and "He goes, and he goes, well, you can't quit. You can't quit. You know, I brought you in. You can't quit." And then I explained the situation. He goes, "You gotta quit." <laughs> Well, remember yeah. Wellington then, 1984, 1985, um, you know, story of Wellington, turn of the century is the largest city in North Carolina, railroad town, railroad pulled out. You're talking uh, about 1810, right? No. 1895. Turn oh, of the really? century. Yeah. Oh, turn of the before century. Before the riots. Right. Yeah. Right. And that was the other thing that, uh, that brought mm. the city down, 1898. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. you, you clear out easily half of the black population of Wilmington in 1898. Well, right. And then the railroad pulled out. You know, had maritime work, the right. port. That was in, what, 60, 61, 62? Something like You're talking that. about Atlantic Railroad? ACL. Yeah. Atlantic Coast. Yeah. Pulled out about 1960. Or yeah, I remember about. the longest railroad in the world for like a month was Wilmington to Weldon Railroad. That's exactly like right. 118 miles or something. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. um... And so when I arrived in Wellington in 84, downtown was desolate. There were, th- there were three gay bars, David's, um, the Flying Dutchman above Stimmerman's, and there's- Mickey Rats? Or that Mickey, Mickey Rats no, that came later. later. Uh-huh. There was a Palladium in there yet or not? And then you had so. Patty's Hollow was a straight bar, and then you uh-huh. had the um, had Irish bar, and then Elijah's down there. That was it. And um, That's true. And, and there so, were still hookers on the street, you know, I, yeah. mean, I was living at fourth and dock and it was a regular traffic by my front porch, um, walking up dock street, you know, hour later right. walking back down dock street. So, yeah. And fourth and dock. I lived in that corner when I came back to do the exorcist three, a quality picture, which I recommend everyone watch. Yeah, for sure. I was um, on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And I was on that white corner across from St. James or that white house on the corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to work one day and Peter Falk was doing another project in town. And he walks down the street in his trench coat like Columbo. And I, I thought I was having a hallucination. It was just like, oh, my God, that's so weird. Do you remember what that was? What did Peter Falk do? I do remember him being in town. Betsy's Wedding, maybe? Mm -mm. No, because I worked on Betsy's Wedding. He wasn't in Betsy's Wedding. The world that Blue Velvet caught was that Wilmington. I think that's why it's kind of beautiful. You really captured that time. The down and dirty. The down and dirty Wilmington, but also a very beautiful, beautiful little city. Right. You know, I had my first apartment, Alan Oleander, and then the fall of 1985, I moved downtown. I moved to Third and Dock, right across from Greystone. Right. And I remember a friend who was gay, who was like, you moved downtown? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were straight. And um, <laughs> and I was like, literally one of the first folks moved downtown. And then this nightclub Cronies opened up. And Cronies was amazing on Second and Princess, which they'd have a jazz band playing there. We'd dance on the tables. And that was really where the film community, we all just sort of gravitated downtown. So it was sort of like a bit of a vacuum. Movie industry shows up, we're making money, we're kind of moving down, and we're partying downtown, and that was cronies. And I do remember walking someone home, Francine. De Corsi? Not Francine De Corsi. Marco Dante. Marco Dante walked her to her apartment, you know, at, after a big night out at cronies, left her at her door at, right at the foot of Market Street. And I turned around. And all the gay bars let loose. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> where's my escort? I had a, I had a, <laughs> Cause the parking lot scene was pretty lively, you know, when the, when oh, the bar yeah. shut down and I had to traverse that to get back to my apartment. And, um, it's a very interesting time down there. And then, and I do think, you know, part of the, what Wilmington's become today was really, was, was incentivized by us crazy filmmakers going down there and partying and his experiences like blue velvet and this, that and the other that really, you know, shine the light on this little town. Mm-hmm. Right. And I mean, I think Dino was, you know, he might not have been the greatest filmmaker in the world, but he was a very astute businessman. And I think that when he made the deal to come in and sort of build the mini studio scenario, he got incredible tax breaks from the governor and he Free got land choice real city estate. And, yeah. And, you know, and he created something, you know, he, he created runaway production as we know it. I mean, Oh yeah. Yeah. And the idea that, you know, that it doesn't have to happen in L.A. or New York is a huge deal. And uh, I mean, I basically owe my career to the guy. I mean, I, I lived in L.A. for a number of years, but was on the road a lot. And he really he took an idea and because he wanted to make more money and he wanted to pay people less. and He wanted to do it on the cheap. But it worked out. It he worked did. out for Wilmington. I, you know, I mean, I was part of that cheap labor. And yeah, I would not have been in the film business at all if Dino hadn't come to Wilmington. You're not cheap, Vernon. You can be had. Well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah I, think you're, I think you're right. I think Wilmington could, the uh, case could be made that it was the first case of runaway production. Yeah. And it was incentivized and the incentive was on our back. We right. were wow. non-union, cheap yeah. labor. Right. Wilmington and, was the third largest producer of films behind L.A. and New York. So and I remember as drivers, we had four and five hour turnarounds sometimes. We had a sign we oh made God. that we would put out Barker loungers and sleep right by the trailers. And the sign said, four hour turnaround, back off. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, on King Kong, we literally had, well, behind the wall of beer, we yeah, yeah. had bunks <laughs> set up because we would work straight through until we dropped and then get up and work again. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we got a promo from Budweiser because we actually had the actress drink a Budweiser on camera. So we were golden and we literally had a wall of long neck Budweiser cases from one side of our warehouse to the other with a doorway on the other side were the bunks. Nice. And so, and there's a wax box too, right? With the hinge top. I don't know anything about it. It was the whole thing. And yeah. so here's, and I do remember that very well because we got the Budweiser promotion. Mm-hmm. 60 cases a week mm-hmm. or something delivered. <laughs> it was incredible. I delivered. Mean, it was real. The monkey's Listen, got a quite a thirst. Then, no. It, and we've got to turn the bottles back in for money. Yeah. Now, hold on. De- <laughs> delivered, delivered, delivered to the set dressing warehouse. And about a week after we got the promotion, it was announced by Martha Schumacher that there will be no rap beer. Because again, back then you, 
production and do rat beer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and of course, everybody <laughs> hung out on the tailgates of the truck yeah. and you know, the trucks were near each other. And so, you know, the grips mm-hmm. would come over and visit and the electricians would go to the grips. And so, yeah, it was a big part. And production would pay for that beer right. often through the prop. But she made the big announcement, no rat beer. So guess what? All that beer landed in the set dressing warehouse, and that's where it stayed. That became the warehouse. Of course, yeah. the other part of what landed in the set dressing warehouse. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, we had the big monkey that was cut up in the operating room. Yep. It yep. had all these huge, you know, dials and gears and everything that needed to work. And so we and had, a to have, machine. <laughs> had to have a gas that was clean and could be used with these machines. And so the gas that was the cheapest... And the most accessible was NO2. nitrous oxide. <laughs> and we had big tanks. We had like eight big tanks of it. Wow. And the rule was you had to have somebody there that was not partaking. Otherwise, somebody could die. Forget, right. forget to breathe. Yeah, yeah exactly. right. And so, you know, we, we followed the rules. Nobody died. So I think on Thursday, the medical truck would show up. Mm-hmm. And- and change out our NO2 bottles. Right. <laughs> on Friday, <laughs> on Friday, the Budweiser truck would show up, change out our Bud bottles. And you know, the Brits, we were working for the Brits um, here. And they always, they had their high tea and they were drinkers and four o'clock. Oh, and sh- four o'clock, uh, 11, they, they had martinis yeah. at lunch. It, it, <laughs> but, but anyway, high tea was the thing. And, and we, we also, we stored all the uh, stunt mats in mm-hmm. our warehouse. Yep. So um, the, 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 one of the rituals became the 10 pound bottle of nitrous oxide with a medical mask in the middle of the, all the stunt mats. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know any of this. It's great. great. <laughs> and, and we're in there hooting and hollering. I think we all had dime store sunglasses on, you know, <laughs> at about four or five o'clock. And one of the, and Craig Carter comes and sticks his nose in and says, looks at us and goes, oh, lads, when you're done with your tea, can you come down to stage four? <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for wrapping it up on Rap Beer. Hey, you want to hear the theme music before we go? Yeah, and uh, free lunch. I'm excited. That's what I'm here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm here for the free food, kind of like film. Sure. Like- <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> oh, oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Uh, did you really have to bribe him with lunch? I did, and um, <laughs> you know that was actually the very first interview that I recorded for Rap Beer. Oh, this okay. is still very much a, a proof of concept that I knew I'd be in a very safe space um, with Vernon and John. We recorded at John's dinner table up in Durham. Oh wow, that's great. That's so good. What what? What funny stories. The, the untold tales of Blue Velvet. All right. Tell everybody who's coming on our next interview. 104. Uh, ne- next up is uh, Robbie Beck, esteemed property master, another um, uh, career-long friend, um, and the amazing Michelle Johnson, a oh. hairstylist, who what I remember most about Michelle was she was one of those characters at the very beginning. She oh. was part of that small family. Yep. And the Jensen's, she's uh, moved on to New York and bigger and brighter things, and she's back home in Wilmington. Oh, and then great. sharing her stories uh, with us on Rap Beer. Well, there you go, guys. So please join us for the next uh, episode of Rap Beer, where stories are being told about storytelling. Be kind, everybody. <laughs>